very warm welcome to uh, Downforce Meets, uh, a man that has uh, been at the forefront of the land speed record, Mr. Richard Noble. Richard, uh, good to hear from you. Thank you very much for your uh, for your time. I know it's very busy with the uh, with the new book uh, that has now just yeah. come out, which is uh, Take Risk, if memory serves me correctly. Um, That's right, Alex. That's absolutely right. And good morning to you. So uh, a very, very interesting read uh, with uh, not just yourself, but also uh, quite a lot of things about uh, how the people that have made everything possible with, with Thrust Thrust 2, Thrust SSC, which still currently holds the world speed record, and obviously with, uh, with Bloodhound as well being a very lengthy project, I think over a decade. Um, but just tell us about the, the genesis of the book itself, Richard, how it, how it all came to be, because you've got uh, quite a lot of experience through engineering, but also uh, in terms of where you started as well, in terms of your, your engineering and uh, uh, career and, and things like that. Alex, well, the situation is quite an interesting one. Basically, what happened was that the UK government defaulted on, our, uh, on a grant to Bloodhound. It was quite a big grant, and that resulted in the, uh, the loss of our Chinese sponsorship. Mm -hmm. uh, because, basically, I think the Chinese simply felt that if the British government wasn't going to do its bit, then why should they? Um, and that uh, really resulted in um, a really difficult time for Bloodhound. Mm -hmm. And of course, we got at that point Brexit, and then of course, um, and so things started to get very, very difficult indeed. And eventually, um, I had to put it into administration. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then it was bought by uh, Ian Warhurst, and Ian, of course, has taken it forward, funded the, uh, uh, the, the runs in South Africa, which is a great achievement. And um, uh, he and I met, and he didn't want me to continue on the program. So I said, fine, that's absolutely right, because. Basically, it needs a change of leadership. I'm very, very tired, and frankly, I don't feel very well. Mm -hmm. And it took me about three months to recover. And then I then sort of, while I was sort of recovering, I then sort of thought, well, you know, what has never been said about all this is that these wonderful people who take a risk to actually help us on our way with these various projects, uh, the people who bent the rules, who tried so hard to, um, to help, who understood what we were trying to do, and then on top of that, we've got this terrible problem in Britain, which is uh, the lack of innovation and the attitude towards anything that's new. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, we've got a real problem on our hands now in this country because, of course, we've got the, the virus. And once we're out of the virus, um, there is an enormous level of debt to be repaid. There are companies to be reformed, um, you know. And basically, we always learn with these projects how to do them very financially effectively. Um, in other words, basically uh, working the team in such a way that there were very, very high levels of motivation and personal achievement. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, the costs weren't all that great. So to break the sound barrier with Thrust SSC is amazing, and we did it on about 4 million in cash. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that figure's wrong, 2.48 million in cash. That's what it was. That, that's, um, a, that's a lot of zeros. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a big car with a hundred thousand horsepower. Yes, um, but also, um, you know, that was uh, that that was another sort of uh, fraught and prolonged struggle. Um, and, and obviously, then you had Thrust Two, which you yourself, if memory serves me correctly, piloted six hundred and thirty-three right, miles an hour. Um, uh, that was just a brilliant car designed by John Aykroyd. Thirty-five thousand horsepower. We designed it for. Um, a peak speed of 650 miles an hour, and we got it. We got 650.88. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it was a great, great team achievement. I mean, especially when you had both John Aykroyd and Ken Norris who helped you in, in designing it. And I remember watching a video of you talking about, you know, as, as soon as you try to go towards Sonic and then supersonic, and you, you, you have the airflow sort of uh, disrupted through... Uh, I can't remember the term that you used in the video when you were being interviewed, but it sort of, like I said, it, it felt like you were driving down... Mm. Starts at about uh, Mach 0 0.82, 0 0.81, 0 0.82, something like that, and we got up to Mach 0 0.84 in Thrust 2. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't a supersonic car, but it was certainly a transonic car, and we could see the shock waves. <laughs> I could see the shock waves from the cockpit. It was an extraordinary experience. Mm -hmm. um, but then, obviously, the, there were other projects that a lot of people uh, know through you, not just through the land speed record attempts, but also the JCB Diesel Max. 
uh, both yep. the ARV and the Farnborough, Farnborough aircrafts as well. Um, yep. And I think, what was it, the ARV, you know, it was achieved in just 13 months from start-up with That's no right, design and little money. Yeah, yeah. I mean... And I still remember the, uh, the meeting I had with the DTI man who'd already sort of um, was very negative towards the project. And I showed him the video of the first, of the first, mile, of the first flight, that in, um, and that was, as you rightly say, 30 months from start-up. And the man couldn't believe it. He said, is it the same airplane? I said, yes, it bloody is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, uh, you know, from from sort of like having witnessed the Cobbs Crusader water speed record challenger at Loch Ness when you were just, what, six? And and, That's right, yeah. and, and, and and from then on, you know, to have that passion for, for engineering. But there was, there was a very interesting quote I remember from you saying that you can't do land speed records with emotion because otherwise you're not the right person for the job because emotion I gets into it. absolutely right. I'd forgotten that, Alex, but you're absolutely right. Because basically it is a very, very cold-blooded thing. And every morning you've got to get up in the morning and, uh, you know, and you're probably starting early in the morning, you've got to get in that, that car and you've got to drive it and you've got to drive it to that graph. And um, the danger with all this is you get a thrill out of it. Mm-hmm. If you get a thrill out of it, you become dangerous. <laughs> you become dangerous to your team and dangerous to yourself. Because, you know, you keep on trying to go faster and faster and so on. The whole thing has to be very tightly disciplined. Mm. And um, so it's a cold-blooded thing. It's really as simple as that. I mean, just from, from your perspective, having done a land speed record yourself with, with Thrust 2, when you get into the car, obviously you've got the checking procedures and everything like that. How do you... How do you sort of steel yourself to say, right, okay, this is the opportunity we have now. You look at it from a, a, a cold, sort of one-sided, em- emotionless sort of aspect. In because obviously both yourself and Andy ha- are the you know two pioneers of of, of British uh, gusto, resolve, and also engineering. Uh, but also I think um, some bravery has to go in there as well because obviously you guys are having to shut off. It's a bit like a, a fighter where they'll have to go into a training camp where they can't be disturbed by friends, family. They've got to concentrate on the job at hand. What, what is going through your mind from, from what you can remember from, from your days with uh, getting behind the wheel of thrust too? Alex, you're part of a team. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a team, we'd come a very, very long way. You know, we'd started from just 175 quid. It'd been a huge, long drive, and you're part of that team. And there's no way you're going to let that team down. Mm-hmm. In terms of fear, um, uh, what you do is you rather put that behind you when you start the program and you say, right, OK, um, we'll see how far I can get with this thing. If I'm not good enough, we'll find somebody else who's better. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, but um, so it's very important that you're not frightened, and it's as I say a very very cold blooded operation. So yeah, you get into the car together with your checklist, and um, you're kind of switched on, <laughs> and then after after that you've got to drive the car to the graph and get the the figure that everybody's looking for. Yes, I mean it's it's just to see you know the the amount of effort that goes into it obviously there's this big release of emotion after when when they go Richard you've done it or Andy you've done it um yeah. that must be a one heck of a relief and just to sort of like a, not just celebrate as a team but I would class more as a uh, very much like a family as well because you're all you're all spending time with each other pretty much most of the days. You're on the phone. You, 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 you're talking about, OK, right, well, how can we reach this particular part of the curve? What do we need yep. to tweak? I mean, that, that, that must be a really good feeling to, to have that opportunity to celebrate with so many people that have worked, goodness knows how many hours a week, trying to get that car built, trying to get that car yep. working to its absolute, absolute optimum to put everything on the line. Point, Alex. The, um, together with the Thrust SSC project, we... We had a real problem with people overworking, and uh, we had to stop work on Sundays. Uh, so Sundays was always the day off because people were getting very, very tired indeed, and uh, you know, 
their faces were getting grey and, uh, you know, it, we're under extreme stress for, for a long, long time. Um, yeah, now the thing about the, the emotion thing is, is quite interesting, is that uh, basically when you've done it, there's a sort of moment of <laughs> when you're not really not quite sure if it really has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, great excitement. My God, we've actually done it. And that's followed very quickly by sadness, enormous sadness. Yeah. Because basically, uh, as you rightly say, you're all part of a family. You've all fought like hell to put this thing together, uh, to get there. And there is no further future other than sort of um, trying to pay off the debts and sell merchandise. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of over. And I still remember this with uh, Thrust 2, that um, there we are, we'd finished it, the car was out on the track, and we suddenly realized we'd got the world land speed record. And people started wandering over the track, which we'd never, ever allowed before. And uh, we tried to stop them, and then we realized that was pointless. <laughs> It, it comes with the territory, I would believe. Um, but also, yeah, um, I think it does. Yes, I think I think one of the the greatest things uh, with with both Thrust Two and and Thrust SSC is that they now have a permanent home in Coventry's uh, Coventry Transport Museum um, as yep. part of the redevelopment project. Um, but to uh, I, I think I've got one real sort of final question with with regards to the book itself, uh, Richard. It's a, it's very very captivating and and I remember, um, sort of like looking through the you know um, ways in which you were you were talking to those that could potentially invest in in what was going to be a project that was going to sort of really really come to credence and that was very much the case with Thrust Two and Thrust SSC and I think I remember one particular point where I think Thrust Two had a passenger seat didn't it. That's correct. Yes. And yep. you said that. Well, if someone isn't really quite convinced, we'll we'll take them out for a we'll take them out for a ride in the car. <laughs> oh yeah, we used to do that. Yes, yeah, bang them up to two hundred and sixty. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 what um, I, I'm sure that there was probably some sort of enjoyment saying, well, I'm going to actually show them what this car is truly capable of, but just give them a little taster of things to come. Um, in many respects, that that just showed how diverse. Um, the way in which you could actually convince or, or, or get somebody on board. I mean, you must have been sort of thinking of quite a few um, prospectuses and, 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 and booklets. I mean, over a course of a period of time, let's say, for instance, Thrust 2, I mean, how, how long through trying to get sponsors on board did it take for you to have the funding in place to have the car fully built, have the team on board and, and everything like that? Because you're all working quite hard. You're having to manage not just... The project, but you're having to manage obviously the, the driving the car to conduct the run yeah. at the end of the day. I mean, how long did the it actually take? Point here, Alex, that uh, the thing is, we never had all the money in place, mm-hmm. and so what you've got to do is you've got to make the money as you go along mm-hmm. because basically, we live in this very, very odd country which uh, doesn't take any risk anywhere, mm-hmm. and so therefore, you can't go and sell shares or anything in this because uh, people just won't underwrite them and won't buy them. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you've got to do is um, the, the magic is sponsorship where the sponsors basically give you money in return for the publicity so mm-hmm. you've got to generate the publicity uh, so you're generating the publicity plus also meeting and, uh, and um, uh, uh, trying to persuade very very large numbers of people huge numbers of people mm-hmm. and every, every uh, inquiry that comes your way has got to be uh, driven right through to its conclusion because you never know how much money, if there is any money, at the other end. So it's an enormous workload. And then we have a supporters club with, uh, for instance, with uh, Bloodhound. It, it, uh, it amounted to some 7,000 people. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've all put, a, um, uh, put their names on the car. There were actually 35,000 names on the car of Bloodhound. Mm-hmm. So you see, what we're trying to do is to do the project but in a way that the country is totally unable to support. Mm-hmm. So it becomes an enormous battle to try and drive the thing through. Um, and you start with no money. You start literally with no money. Mm-hmm. And you never have a situation where um, you've got a huge bank balance. That never happens. Mm-hmm. Just bit by bit by bit. Incremental funding the whole way down the line. Very, very tough. Very tough on everybody because they never know quite whether... Uh, there's enough money to pay them. And for instance, with the Thrust SSC project, 
um, um, uh, literally a month before we were due to go, we were only at about 17% of budget, but we made it. That's quite an interesting statistic that you just uh, revealed there, Richard. Yeah, but, um, one of the points I want to make in the book, which is basically we've got to change this country. Mm-hmm. Um, it's far too self-satisfied. Um, people don't take any risk. That's why the book's called Take Risk. Uh, and so these things just don't happen unless you, you're prepared to commit to battle on an enormous scale to try and change it. And you can see that um, in all of various projects, we've ended up with... Uh, uh, various stages with the Department of Trade and Industry or BIS or BEIS, and they've all proved absolutely hopeless. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get very excited by it and then they run away when there's a possibility of making up some money. Um, and we need these people to, to change. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the competence of government, etc., has really got to change. You can see all this with the PPE situation at the moment. You know, mm-hmm. this is simple stuff, but they're not delivering. And, uh, you, you know, uh, it's, um, as, as somebody who runs these projects and understands these projects, you can see exactly what's happened. I mean, the decisions, poor decisions were made at the early stage. And so consequently, you know, you end up with a situation where of uh, an underperformance situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is how we all live. <laughs> that's, that's very, very true. Really do appreciate your insight there, Richard. So... Uh, for those wondering, you can uh, get Take Risk from Evro Publishing, available uh, in hardback copy at nineteen ninety nine. It's also available on Kindle uh, as an ebook and also an audio book. Thank you very much, Richard, for your time. Really, really do appreciate your your contributions to uh, not just the Land Speed Records, but also to engineering uh, and ingenuity in, in, in a very, very uh, profound way uh, through your relevant projects as well. Thank you so much, Alex, and I really value the time, and thank you. Downforce Meets with Richard Noble. Presented by Alex Goldschmidt. Produced by Florian Schmeis. This has been a high-speed Autobahn production for Downforce Racing. Thank you for listening. <laughs>